Hi everyone, welcome and thank you for joining today's technical topic webinar. My name is Jezreel and I'm a marketing officer here at EIT and I'll be hosting the session today. So our webinar today will be covering the use of gaming technology to improve industrial digital twins. So we have Mr. Greg Seville, um, an experienced engineer and of course representing Sentient Computing, um, a software company based in Perth, Western Australia, um, who is our presenter for today. Um, we'll get him to talk more about himself in just a bit. But before we kick off today's webinar, I would just like to go over some Blackboard notification and sound settings. So um, we definitely encourage participation during the session, but because of that, we do expect some messages going up in the chat box as is happening now, um, as you know, Greg um, presents. So we definitely recommend turning off all notifications beforehand. To do this, it's really simple. Just click on that little settings um, or cock icon at the bottom right of your screen. Um, go to notification settings and untick all of the options. If you have any issues, um, just let me know in the chat box, but it should be pretty straightforward. Yeah, um, and just to address some of the common questions that we get quite a lot. So um, regarding the presentation slides as well as the session recordings. Um, for everyone who registered for this webinar, you will definitely receive an email with a copy of today's full presentation slides as well as the recording. Um, please kindly allow one to two business days from when um, you complete the survey for it to come true to your inbox. Um, if you do not see it in your inbox um, after that time window, then there's a chance that it might be um, in your junk folder. So make sure to check that as well um, and then our certificate of attendance if you would like a certificate of attendance please make sure to request it at the end of the session by filling up the short survey response basically there will be a qr code as well as a qr link for you to do that the qr link is basically an alternative if um, you have problems scanning the qr code both of these options will be provided at the very end of the session once we're done with the webinar. So we ask that you be patient until then. Um, once you submit your survey response and we have received it, we will then send the set of attendance to you. And you can expect that um, within the next three to four business days after this session. Um, please bear in mind that if it has passed that three to four business days window, then the survey will expire and we cannot issue you the certificate even if you um, email us at our webinar contact. So make sure you do this within the time frame. And then also um, regarding any questions that you may have during the session, um, we're definitely happy for you to leave them in the chat box as the session runs. Um, the interaction is completely appreciated, but we will aim to get most of them at the get to most of them at the end of the session. Right. And if just a bit about EIT, if you are joining our webinar for the first time or you're unfamiliar with us, we are one of the only institutes in the world specializing in engineering. We currently offer a range of industry focus in the line courses, mainly a across um, the core areas of engineering. So civil, mechanical, electrical, and industrial automation engineering. Um, and it ranges from short courses all the way to um, a doctor of engineering degree. All of our courses are offered online and also on campus for um, selected courses, which means that students can study um, from whenever, wherever they are in the world, but um, also experience studying engineering in Australia if they want to. Um, um, all our vocational programs and higher ed degrees are recognized and accredited by um, the Australian government. But we do also have um, a number of courses recognized under one of the, um, they are internationally recognized under one of the three international courts. So yeah, um, that's a bit about us. And all right, so I'll now pass it over to Greg, who will cover the rest of this session. Greg, um, please go ahead. Okay, just give me a moment. I'll try and share my video and no worries. share my screen. Okay. 
Hopefully you can see my screen. I think that's yes. All right. Uh, hello. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's webinar. And thanks, <clears throat> Jazreel, for the introduction. I was hoping not to have to speak about myself, but I guess uh, I'll do a quick intro. Uh, I've actually got an oil and gas background in engineering. I had 10 years in various technical and management roles across Asia PAC before returning to Australia in 2020 and joining Sentient. In my current role, I'm responsible for Indy, which is our digital twin product. And Indy is currently deployed and in production at several large resource companies in Australia. So what I'm sharing today is built on actual experiences and challenges. We've been quite successful from a technology perspective, in particular at managing extremely large 3D digital twins for customers that are quite a bit bigger than we are. But it hasn't always been a straight line journey and it's really boring. I imagine that some of you will already be quite familiar with the digital twin buzzword. It gets thrown about a fair bit and has become a bit of a catch-all that refers to a data system aggregator or a complex simulator. If you have a good understanding of these things and you're looking for an in-depth treatise on digital twin ontology, then this may not be the webinar for you. Today, instead, we will take a high level look at what a digital twin means to most organizations and talk about how they are actually being used in industry in 2022. We will draw upon our experience at Sentient to discuss some of the key challenges that we've come across when dealing with the massive scale of industrial digital twins. And we'll explain why gaming technology can be useful in overcoming some of these challenges. After a case study, uh, we'll finish up with a high level look at the challenges that we continue to face, the areas that we're looking to develop further, and some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. And then uh, I don't have visibility of the chat log, so I've got a trusty assistant here who will be collating questions. Um, I'll try and answer them all at the end, but if anything urgent pops up, uh, I'll try and get to it as well. Okay, cool. I'll hide that as well. All right, so what do I mean when I'm talking about a digital twin? As I mentioned at the start, digital twin is a bit of a catch-all term that can lead to confusion, but the concept is actually quite simple. At the basic level, a digital twin is a virtual copy of a physical asset in some way. We don't have to make the virtual copy look like the real thing to fulfill this, but in 2022, generally we do have a visual representation and it tends to be 3D. Am I gonna go forward? There we go. Um, so if you have a base model, you can make a virtual copy of that thing look like it. For a digital twin to have a little bit more value though, it needs to be tied to that physical asset in some way typically through sensors that are attached to that object. This allows us to look at our virtual copy and see what's actually happening in the real world. So in the example of our wind turbine there, you can see that it's rotating at say 17.9 uh, RPM. In a lot of cases, there can be information or sensors that aren't specifically a part of that asset, but also add contextual information, such as IoT sensors that have been retrofitted or contextual information like the weather. In this example, maybe wind forecasts are of interest, but for things like solar panels, it could be cloud cover or other things. Um, and so on and so forth, adding maintenance records, manuals, and simulation logic or physics engines until we have as complete a picture of the original asset and its environment as possible. The ideal digital twin is so perfect a replica of the physical asset that you can experiment upon it to find out exactly when like a part might fail or to find out optimal operating parameters in a complex process. But achieving an ideal state is an aspirational concept that isn't practically achievable at scale, at least not yet. However, we are chipping away quite significantly at the edges of this concept. And in 2022, there's still a lot of value to be drawn from a digital twin in progress. One very simple use case is to be able to search for and find assets in a complicated facility. We have some customers with millions of objects of interest that are inferred, that are referred to by poetic and memorable names like PC3-CD101-A01 and other customers that are looking for a damaged, well, where are we? A damaged roller, for example, on a conveyor belt that might stretch for kilometers. In these cases, being able to search for and fly to that asset can save maintenance planners and field personnel from scouring through PDFs or hunting for a damaged roller in a haystack. My controls are not great. There we go. Uh, taking that a step further, 
those employees can actually use a virtual copy to check in on the state of a facility from their laptop or from a mobile device. This little video shows how live and historical data can be viewed within an application, and it was put together in collaboration with Wally. Once the data is in the system, there are a number of ways that you can present that to a worker, like highlighting objects that are in an alarm stake, or adding world space UI elements that show key parameters. You can also allow people to define the information that they see based on the relevance to their role or their current task. So we could supplement this information with things like camera feeds, microphones, or image banks. The virtual environment also has another few like nifty um, benefits as well. It can make it easy for you to work out, for example, which cameras can see a certain point in space. So instead of having to scour through a list, you can click on a point and say, which cameras can see me? And it will pull up those feeds. Improved human, sim uh, human system interaction is about enabling people to engage with the system the way that suits their task best. Sometimes that is simply searching through a list of assets in a text-based list, but in other instances, it might be to put on a VR headset and get a sense of scale. Perhaps to decide where to position a crane and where spotters need to be in a complex lift, or maybe to decide where to install a new stop sign at an intersection. Uh, probably the most common use case that we come across at Sentient is workflow optimization. Most owners of large industrial assets have a lot of different data repositories that serve a specific purpose. In almost all cases, the company will have a SCADA or HMI control system that does its job very well for control system engineers in the control center, but is largely disconnected from the rest of the organization, some of whom would benefit from being able to see exactly how their plant is or was functioning at some point in time. There's always at least one health monitoring, wrong arrow. <clears throat> There's always at least one health monitoring platform. So that's SCADA and Trend Applications. There's always at least one health monitoring platform that is being used by the maintenance team. But in some cases, different engineering functions may use different platforms for specialized equipment, or different sites might use different platforms. Document management systems are usually common across an organization, but they can be necessarily cumbersome as they try to catalog masses of disparate data. They can be especially challenging to navigate for contractors or new employees. ERP systems suffer from a similar burden of complexity as each function may use only a thin slice of the platform for their particular role. In each of these cases, if an engineer or a technician wants to understand the particular problem that they have on site or plan for some upcoming work, they would traditionally have to find the equipment of interest in each of these specific systems. By tying the 3D content to a unique identifier and in turn mapping that identifier to the appropriate piece of equipment in each of the platforms, a digital twin can gather information together in one place and provide a seamless interface to the data of interest. This is particularly useful as the workforce, <laughs> as the workforce continues to change and we see a lot of lifer employees retiring from the resource sector to be replaced by a new generation that is more itinerant than the last and keener to move between roles. A modern way of engaging with an asset helps to speed up onboarding, in particular for people who have grown up with technology and have certain expectations about how data will be arranged and presented to them. All of this is a precursory step for more complex use cases. Staying on the human workflow side, the left side of the slide, once the data is aggregated, we can build event-based notifications for a particular user or role that will notify them when something that impacts their role occurs. For example, a facility administration staff might be notified when an employee misses a flight to an offshore installation. An operator might be notified when a work permit is scheduled near to his or her work area. And a manager might be notified when critical infrastructure is impacted in a way that may impact delivery schedules. Moreover, standard workflows and procedures can be baked into the digital twins logic that drives the correct behavior from respondents. This can be as simple as directing the user to an appropriate document, or it could even be a guided response that requires the user to check off tasks in a checklist or make specific decisions in order to satisfy a necessary intervention. Moving to the right side, uh, the procedural side of the slide, um, once the data is aggregated, we can start to play around with more complete data models. 
for an asset. And this can allow for business or process optimization. This is the traditional GE or IBM concept of a digital twin that allows us to take our wind turbine and fast forward it to determine when it might fail. Alternatively, we can work out what water injection rates will optimize the recovery from an oil and gas reservoir, et cetera, et cetera. These optimization processes can be driven by somewhat generic machine learning algorithms, but they do often require some domain expertise as well. Automation is another natural extension of that workflow optimization. Once correct response behavior is well known enough that it requires minimal human input, input it can make sense to spare the human the hassle and to allow the digital twin itself to schedule a response on the physical asset. This can be through allowing the digital twin to control system parameters, or even through allowing it to schedule work with robots on site. Of all the use cases listed here, we at Sentient have the least experience in the robotic side of automation. But a few of our customers are quite far down this road and have robots from Boston Dynamics wandering around their facilities or automated drones conducting routine scans of massive areas. Uh, I think it still might be a little while though before all of the safety critical tasks are uh, scheduled and conducted without human oversight. Though. Uh, stepping back from the future and more into my comfort zone again, digital twins are already being used to improve operational training. In a digital replica of a facility, we can really rapidly spin up traditional stepwise training facilities uh, scenarios like the one you see in this video. An existing operating procedure can automatically, or with very little effort, be converted into a step-by-step -step training scenario by tying objects in the procedure to their equipment ID. In the most basic form, this can be a fly to and describe scenario. However, a more exciting approach is available when the digital twin is built out to include process logic. For example, when this valve is opened, fluid will flow through that pipe and into separator XYZ. With even basic logic built into the digital twin, a sandbox training environment can be created that allows for immersive training experiences. In these environments, new employees can safely familiarize themselves with a new asset, new equipment, or a complex operating procedure. This second video is an example of a high voltage switching uh, training procedure. High voltage switching is a great fit for virtual training as HV switches are dangerous pieces of equipment. Errors can, in the most severe circumstances, result in fatalities. Moreover, they are expensive, large, and they usually come in custom configurations. Having each type of switch available for individual training is rarely affordable or practical for a company. In a digital twin, the trainee can familiarize themselves and be tested for competency on the exact configuration that they'll see at site. Most of these solutions have existed for decades longer than the term digital twin in some shape or form. You may be asking, how is this different from a simulator? We've had them for years. And it would be a pretty good question. The cheeky answer is semantics, but the general view is what separates a digital twin from a simulator or a model viewer is an asset centric approach that treats the asset as the focus rather than the data system or the platform. A digital twin generally also includes a direct link to the physical asset via sensors, whereas old sims typically weren't actually connected to the physical asset and they operated in a, in a silo. In a digital twin, we've gone aggregating systems to build a more complete model of that asset that elevates uh, each of these use cases by either providing enhanced functionality or improved quality of outcomes. An ideal digital twin would fulfill each of these use cases and more. It would be, as I mentioned before, a perfect replica of the physical asset and allow you to check the current corrosion level of the pipe over there or to 3D print a replacement for the fitting that was damaged on pressure vessel P801. It would allow you to list all of the parts needed to conduct a repair on the pump that just broke down next to it and allow you to order all those parts from inventory, providing a lead time for any that might not be readily available. In fact, the data model of the plant and operating environment would be so good that it would have known maintenance was required months ago and would have already ordered the parts for you. There would be a permit in place for the pump to be repaired and it would have been scheduled so that there was no downtime to the operation. Maybe a robot was scheduled to perform the repair. 
It's a pretty incredible aspiration, and there are bits and pieces of that vision that we're realizing already, as we've shown. However, the full solution is an enormous problem to solve. And that's why the digital twin term, which can rightly apply to anything that meets one of these functions, can be quite vague and nonspecific. So for me, it helps to consider the problem split into two hemispheres. You've got digital twin providers that aim to aggregate data and expose it across silos to create more natural ways for people to work, this workflow-focused digital twin. That's mostly what we do here at Sentient. Uh, on the other side of the piece, you've got people who are focused on trying to create as complete a data picture of the, of the physical asset as possible to improve simulation outcomes. There is some overlapping functionality, but simulation and visualization are both complex enough in their own right to still be somewhat specialized. So you don't have one company that does everything really, really well. Some other terms that are useful and get thrown around for digital twins a lot are ops digital twins and design digital twins. Uh, they're pretty straightforward to understand. The fundamental difference here being that a design twin is for an asset that has not yet been built. It's used to improve visibility across a project and to facilitate design reviews across different functions. An ops twin is built is for a, an already constructed asset, and it's used to manage the asset throughout its active life and sometimes beyond. Asset, system, and process twins are more or less what they sound like too. In this context, an asset twin is li limited in scope to a single piece of equipment. A system twin is related to a specific system within a plant, and a process twin is an overarching twin of an entire process plant or facility. At Sentient, we focus on building workflow-oriented ops twins. So let's talk about them. There are a few things that we might need to consider when we're building or selecting a digital twin product. A digital twin should be able to handle very, very large facilities with lots of objects of interest. Some of our mining customers have assets with footprints that are hundreds of square kilometers and are connected the rail, with rail lines that sprawl for hundreds of kilometers in their own right. At the same time, some use cases require the digital twins to provide engineering levels of detail uh, and precision up close. To fulfill one of these requirements is fairly simple. But to provide both on corporate hardware is challenging. On top of this, for the digital twin to actually add value to a worker's life, it needs to provide a more efficient solution than the current way that they're working. That means that the digital twin needs to be really responsive. Employees should not be waiting on the system to load, and it needs to be designed in a way that requires as little uh, esoteric knowledge or training as possible. Stability and reliability. So business uh, B2B software is quite different in scale to B2C software in that typically we're targeting only a few hundred users, maybe a thousand at most, um, that are either the asset owner, they work for the asset owner, or in some rare cases are uh, oddball parties like investors. Still, our most active digital twins are currently approaching a thousand monthly active users, and this can put a significant load on the customer's infrastructure if it's poorly designed. Uh, the deployment also needs to be stable and secure. At most large companies, there's an eagerness to innovate and find creative solutions. And there's often a lot of support for a small pilot project or for a proof of concept. However, for a system to actually be deployed at one of these large companies to production, it really needs to be built on established or proven technology. Uh, unfortunately, we've yet to come across two customers that manage their digital assets in exactly the same way. In fact, most of our customers have huge variance in the quality and the type of data available for each of their assets. This is not surprising, given that we've built digital twins for assets that date back four decades and for assets that are still in design and yet to be completed. The good news is that the industry is improving and standards are being more rigorously applied. However, a good digital twin needs to be able to handle mixed and imperfect source data. In fact, one possible use of a digital twin is to assist in tidying and standardizing poor or partial source content. Even when things are perfect, 3D models, high resolution train maps, voxels, photogrammetry scans, and LiDAR scans might need to be processed. On the other side, 
The digital twin needs to be deployable to multiple targets, ranging from high-end engineer spec computers down to mobile devices and the dreaded corporate laptop. This device often has eight gig of RAM and an integrated graphics card, as well as a bunch of forcibly installed software that's competing for these limited resources. Finally, a digital twin is different from a targeted fit for purpose simulator or from a control system. It's a serious investment that will be most valuable when it's maintained alongside the physical asset. This means ensuring that updates made in the real world are replicated in the virtual environment. But it also means that the software itself should be keeping pace with industry developments. A plan built in 2022 should not be burdened with a vintage 22 digital twin that is kept on life support as the rest of the world moves on. Each of these seven requirements needs to be addressed before advanced functionality is added. A pretty common thought that we hear a lot is, why not extend the functionality of my engineering design or my CAD software that already handles my models? So let's have a look at that, uh, that concept. Engineering design software is excellent at managing precise detail. It can also handle very large models. However, performance tends to deteriorate a little as the models grow and it starts to chug. These environments can become quite cumbersome to work around. Moreover, the hardware requirements spike into levels that are generally impractical for large businesses. These software packages have been designed to assist in the precise creation of 3D content, and they do this job really, really well. They are stable and reliable enough for these tasks. But as excessive software packages, sorry, expensive software packages, sometimes excessive, with per seat licenses, they generally see relatively low user volumes and they are nascent in their development of multi-user functionality. Almost all of these major platforms can handle each other's uh, content and FBX models, for example, but they're pretty new to providing live links to data at runtime, a function at the very heart of digital twins. Finally, continuous improvement. These software packages have been around for years and have proven their ability to incrementally improve. However, Moving into the realm of digital twins means ensuring that their product retains integrations to all sorts of new industry areas. Control systems, sensors, robotics, scan data, XR hardware, and whatever else is new and around the corner. When you look at it on mass as a whole, um, there is a fair bit of overlap between the two industries, but there's still a considerable gap to close. The majority of the functionality that the CAD design tool is used for is of little value to the end user which carries a considerable technical burden. Rather than trying to extend functionality to all these areas, which can require massive rewrites of a code base, there is another industry that has already walked this path. That industry has moved from a fun-loving childhood through a stage of passionate adolescence into, for better or worse, a more mature phase where few major players are responsible for the infrastructure or engines upon which the majority of the content is developed. I'm talking, I'm sure you can guess, given the presentation, about the gaming industry. Specifically, though, video games, not casinos. Improving graphics by addressing massive scale uh, and trying to optimize fine detail has been at the core of gaming innovation pretty much since forever. So my first memories of gaming date back conveniently to the early days of first-person shooters as they were starting to transition from sprite-based shooters into true 3D environments. Video games have been taking place in virtual worlds since they began, but if you're a little bit older than I am, in 1993, you might've found yourself anticipating an exciting new shooter from ID Software. Doom would be set in a research base and another dimension. And while it was a sprite-based shooter, it was set to feature fully texture mapped map walls, floors, and ceilings, which is incredible. Lighting effects so that distant objects are shrouded in darkness unless there's a nearby light source. Up to four players on LAN and two via a modem and a seamless world inside and out. That last one was a visionary change from the traditional level by level approach of similar games to date. That the ambitious and peerless team at ID Software took about a month to realize, no matter how they skinned it, they did not have the memory available to achieve. 
And so they reverted to a level-based approach. But the idea was there. Impressed by the modding community in Wolfenstein 3D, the dev team built the Doom engine to read in from external WAD or WAD files that contained graphical content and level designs. This allowed the Doom engine to be easily leveraged by the community. The engine itself was licensed by other developers who could leverage the data structures and underlying technology in the game to create other content. For example, they had, uh, I think, the first BSP tree implementation of any gaming uh, engine. ID followed the success of Doom with Quake in 1996. Quake broke new territory by actually delivering a 3D world and some key 3D optimizations, such as Z buffering, pre rendering of certain map components. Uh, Valve's Gold Source engine, which is retrospectively named, um, powered Half-Life and it was built atop, on top of a heavily modified version of the Quake engine. It was also at this time in 1998 when the first Unreal game was released on the inaugural version of the Unreal engine. So, by 1998, we had immersive 3D virtual worlds that could be created by hobbyists and ran on engines that were built by only a handful of developers for extremely limited hardware. Meanwhile, in the control system space, engineers controlling multi-million dollar assets were generally looking at, if they were lucky, colored dots on a black screen, cross-referencing them with 2D schematics. Still, I'll admit that this looks a little bit less precisely detailed than a CAD drawing requires, and the scale, while impressive, was constrained and confined by the hardware of the time. It was only a few years later, in 2001, however, when the team at DMA Design, which is now Rockstar Games, decided that the increased hardware specs of the PS2 meant that they could realize the old Doom vision of less than a decade prior and create a seamless 3D world. Their mission was to ensure that a player could appropriate a vehicle and drive it at full speed and not have everything break down. Despite the PlayStation 2 having 32 meg of RAM, about 32 times that available to the Doom engine in 1992, the team started butting up against the same memory constraints. The genius for them came from realizing that the massive storage space available on the DVD discs, massive at the time, uh, that the PS2 accepted, could allow them to stream in content and create a full streaming 3D world. By tuning and tweaking the engine, they were able to realize this vision. They'd achieved what I'd consider a massive scale with a city stretching kilometers. And they had pretty good detail up close. It's a little, little way off, maybe. Um, but in the 21 years since that, that gap as well has been breached, and gaming has continued to push hardware development, and hardware has in turn pushed gaming as the industry continued to improve in its realism and detail. Looking at responsiveness and stability, um, over those 21 years, we've seen the rise and the rise of an interesting thing called the game engine which has developed from a means to a gaming end into a sort of platform as a service core business with titans of the industry that power the majority of the content. Some neat investigative work conducted by these fellows down here, if you're interested, um, on gamedeveloper.com puts rough numbers to the magnitude of this shift. So this data has been scraped from Steam, so it reflects the, uh, the PC gaming world, but it gives a good overview. In 2010, 86% of games on the Steam platform were built upon a non-standard or a custom engine. At this time, Unreal was well into its third version, and in addition to major improvements to its renderer, physics system, and sound system, allowed for more customization than in previous versions. That netted them a whopping 5% of games on Steam. Unity was only five years old and had just released version three. It was making pretty big waves in multi-platform development, but only scores about 2.5% of market share in 2010. Moving forward 11 years, <clears throat> the market's inverted completely, and now less than 20% of games are made with custom or proprietary engines. Unity accounts for almost half of all games on Steam, and Unreal accounts for a whopping 15%. So almost two thirds of games on Steam, a reasonable cross-section of the PC gaming market, are built on either Unity or Unreal. This does not account for the growing XR and mobile markets, where Unity in particular continues to dominate with an estimated percent of the XR market share. Estimated by them, so grain of salt. 
This means that Unity and, and Unreal, the giants of the game engine space, can provide a game engine as a service to about 70% of games and spend their earnings on providing improved out-of-the-box support for efficient modding, lots of programming, detailed lighting, physics engines, etc. that allow us to render pixel-perfect engineering spec content up close while still performantly displaying an entire facility. Generally, it's only the highest grossing games that can afford to be in that 20% um, of custom proprietary engines, as the cost of building an engine to compete with these majors in the modern age requires a scale and guaranteed return on investment. Even if there are efficiencies to be gained from having a targeted approach for your platform. It also means that games built on Unity and Unreal are tested a lot. Unity boasts 2.8 billion monthly active users across mobile and conventional platforms, which is a huge number. Um, and it has 750,000 registered developers. This means an active community testing and ensuring that both the development environment and common components in the runtime environment are well tested. Moreover, there is a community of developers with skills working within the Unity engine that makes scaling up a business far easier. Uh, it goes without saying, and I won't labor the point, that games have been managing multi-user environments since Dooms, four people on LAN, and two people on modem. Uh, and this is a tested and easily extensible component of a good game engine. Uh, input flexibility and output flexibility, I think this one's pretty well known as well, so I won't labor it. But one of the key benefits of gaming technology is that somebody else is maintaining the multi-platform support. So when new hardware is released, these gaming engines are pretty quick. They're usually the first to build pipelines supporting that hardware. This is a major reason of why 70% of XR content and 50% of all mobile games are created on Unity, for example. It also means that we can target multiple platforms within the same project. For example, when our digital twin journey began, modern VR was in its infancy. So we've actually had a, a, a case when this came in quite handy for us. Um, we created a few modules in VR, and actually that's something else that we do, training stuff in, in VR. But we were moving into a fresh and largely unexplored territory. At that stage, there was no firm plan, uh, no vision to include VR support in our digital twin. It wasn't a focus area. However, while we were working on building out various key features for our customers and different use cases for the digital twin, Unity continued to expand its support for XR. Until in late 2020, when one of our customers did request VR functionality, we were able to easily leverage our engine and provide VR content at little cost to our business. Finally, looking at gaming technology from a continuous improvement perspective, um, leveraging gaming technology, and in particular a game engine, we benefit from access to a platform that is tested by billions, has a thriving developer community to hire from, does a lot of the basic work required to build a 2D or 3D application, supports all major platforms, and is dedicated to democratizing the development of real-time rendering technology. It allows us to focus on what we do and leverage them for the gaming component. So this is an example of how it's helped us to continually, to continually improve. Um, over the past two years, while we've been focusing on adding functionality, uh, our digital twin has gone from looking like this to looking like this. Um, a fair bit of work on our side as well, but largely leveraging engine development. So how do you get into using game technology with a digital twin? It all sounds pretty good. Um, they do do. There's obviously a good fit there. But what would a gaming technology approach look like? There are a few ways you can go about leveraging gaming technology in a product. Most of the game engines come with an asset processing pipeline of some description. Or put another way, a way to process content from a source format into a condition that allows for fast runtime rendering. A project is created within the game engine, and you can begin constructing a 3D environment supported by out-of-the-box tools. Lighting, textures, and automatic UV mapping, audio content, UI elements can all be added to the environment relatively easily with pre-existing features. Lotting and standard optimizations, lotting being level of detail and providing different, um, yeah, I'll get into it later. If anyone has any questions, that's maybe one for the end. Um, and they can be leveraged from day one, not to mention particle effects, networking layers, and several render pipelines. In fact, growing support for BIM3 and industrial support in the game engine uh, itself means that it's possible now to build a digital twin without much or any customization of the game engine itself. But the great flexibility of this approach 
is that we can extend and use parts of the game engine that fit our purpose and develop customized or in-house solutions for elements that might not be fit for our purpose. For example, once we have a base environment functioning, the asset pipeline can be modified or upgraded to perform specific tasks based on metadata encoded in the source or CAD models. Additionally, optimizations that specifically address common peculiarities in our source material can be implemented and so on. We may then decide that the game engine is doing a great job of handling the 3D rendering, but we want to leverage different technology uh, for managing our simulation engine. In this case, we can connect our spatial digital twin to the digital twin logic that, it's, that we build on maybe a web technology stack. We then build an interop layer that is responsible for connecting the digital twin logic to the spatial environment and away we go. This is uh, the example because it's a solution that we landed upon after some early frustrations trying to solve all of our problems within the one environment. With this sort of configuration, we can be confident that our 3D virtual world will continue to be feature rich, stable and contemporary. While we are able to integrate bidirectionally with other applications through APIs governed by our web stack. Whichever way you choose to go, a good game engine can lower the barrier for entry in providing solutions to industry in exactly the same way it does to game developers. Allowing a game developer to move into spe addressing specific use cases and delivering value early and regularly. An example of this in action was one of our first large scale digital twin instances developed for a major Australian miner. Um, so putting this into practice, They'd had a serious incident, unfortunately, at one of their events, uh, sorry, one of their facilities, and a review into the incident determined that the worker had used an old version of an operating procedure to undertake a task. In doing so, some critical safety steps that had late, maybe later been discovered and introduced were skipped and tragedy struck. Some further investigation determined that the old version of a procedure had been taken offline and saved to that employee's local computer. To anyone that's worked in a field location, this is a classic challenge for large organizations. Most field employees that I've worked with are competent, they're safety conscious, and they really want to do the right thing. There's a general understanding that uncontrolled documentation is a risk, but trying to find the correct documentation in one of the various places that it could be logically stored while navigating through authentication hurdles in each of these applications is frustrating and it takes time. It often feels logical after a few minutes of frustrated searching to find the document that you're looking for, um, to save that document that you finally found and checked out so that next time is more efficient. This is bad behavior and we knew it in the field. This customer also identified the fault in the behavior and it, in perhaps my previous life, typically we'd, we'd call that the root cause, we'd discipline the person and then we'd move on. But this customer decided to take it a step further and instead make life easier for the individuals and to try to find a new, more practical, user-centric way to access documentation that encouraged good behavior. A single system that instead of making it less hassle than the existing system would be less hassle than the bad behavior of accessing a local file itself. The solution that was proposed was an ops digital twin that took an asset-centric approach to data access. That means an employee that was conducting work on a single piece of equipment would be able to find that piece of equipment either via a direct search, via a fuzzy search, or to spatially locate that pump within the environment. A single click should give the user pre-authenticated access to the customer's document management system, either loading the content within the digital twin or taking the user directly to that file or platform. Unfortunately, uh, we, I wasn't prepared enough and uh, I did have a, have a video to show you of the exact installation, but I was unable to get a release for this presentation. So you'll have to take my word that it is very impressive. Instead, what you're seeing right now is a hurriedly recorded video this morning of our little demo station uh, that shows the look and feel of our digital twin. And then after this video, there'll be an older version, uh, which has some real data behind it that we are allowed to share. So development challenges. Massive sites. Our customer has massive sites, basically. The pilot was not their largest, but it still spanned many kilometers in length and width, and it contained thousands of objects of interest. Source models were available, but the site was planned in the late 2000s, just under a decade before we started work, at a time when standards were not typically defined in the source models. The average work computer that the operators had as well was the usual dreaded corporate laptop, 
um, and was a basic workstation with eight mega RAM and integrated graphics cards. And the internet connection at site was expected to be poor or limited. So it was clear that delivering an application that a field operator could be reasonably expected to use in preference of their local desktop would mean significant effort in optimizing the 3D rendering. The key criteria was not beauty, but functionality. And this problem could be reasonably expected to apply also to other uh, operators in the natural resource industry, or so we hoped. So we took our nascent digital twin product, which is built upon the Unity engine, and we started modifying components to improve performance for the specific challenges of this customer. And we hoped other customers in the industry. We created our implementation of H loss and chunking and implemented some clever solutions to overcome data loss that normally comes with chunking or merging objects to save draw pool. So we did a bunch of uh, extra work on top of the engine. And in the end, uh, the outcome was that we were able to come up with a solution in a few months that met the initial objective, uh, providing a spatial interface to the customer's data that was quick and easy to use. The project was a success and led to incremental work with a value driven approach. First, we worked to get the rest of the customer sites live. Um, and after some adjustments to our processes, both sentient and uh, on the customer side, we were successful. And now a user of the digital twin can visit any of the customers Australian sites from the one platform. The process of adding a site has become so streamlined that when the most recent plant was added, there was almost no human involvement at all to move from CAD source into a functional digital twin that was connected to their data systems and textured automatically based on information that's encoded within the source CAD model. We've connected to the platform, uh, the platform to six different data platforms like model, data document management system, SCADA, SAP, a uh, health monitoring system and their permit system. And the site condition is displayed in world space application cards over the site. We have about 100, I think, monthly active users of the platform, and we're focusing on trying to raise its profile within the company. So we as a collaborative, not just us. Um, and the customer initially estimated, I think, in the prospectus, about $3 million in savings per year just could be realized just from that first use case. And I think we've exceeded that limit fairly well. Cool. So that's uh, the case study. Taking a step back and speaking more generally, uh, I'll just talk about the industry and the challenges that we see at the moment, where we think it's heading, and some of the lessons learned to close this out. And based on time, I think I'm going okay. Cool. Um, so speaking more generally, there are, of course, downsides to any methodology, uh, including using a game engine. <clears throat> and there are a few challenges that we've had to overcome over the years. With relation to the rendering challenges, our specialization in this area is a double-edged sword because there's always more that we want to achieve. Uh, we've successfully managed to handle rendering massive sites on average hardware with textures, shaders, shadows, and some other post effects, but we would love to add higher res textures, more dynamic lighting effects, et cetera, et cetera. We sometimes have to physically restrain our developers from making further optimizations or from chasing the cool, but at present low value uh, tasks. There are always memory um, and speed optimizations that became, can be made. And I think this is still an area that will develop further as you start to layer on higher quality photogrammetry and LiDAR stuff. Um, and there is a growing trend to try and solve that within industry by using large GPU farms to do the heavy lifting and to stream the output to the customer. <clears throat> we haven't moved down this path yet um, as it has its own drawbacks, particularly when there's significant network latency and it can ex impact the end user's experience. This is especially the case in VR, where even small lags can cause a user to feel sick. But it's likely this tech will improve uh, and become more and more a part of a complete solution. Uh, of course, just waiting as well will help the hardware to develop, uh, waiting for some more graphics cards to be released this year, and that will allow us to push things further as well. On the digital twin side, the challenges that we've come across most commonly are lack of standardization in the source material that we're receiving. I've talked a fair bit about models and their metadata, as that's probably the most common issue. However, inconsistent references to the same object across different software platforms that we're trying to integrate to is another one. It's not complicated to fix, uh, but it typically does take some combination of manual labor and pattern-based automatic processing, and it can be quite a, a cost drain. Fortunately, the industry is maturing, and there's a general push for consistency, at least within most of the organizations that we work with. There's not always so much consistency, however, between the different organizations. 
Specialized use cases is another challenge. Um, a lot of the high value things that we could deliver require specific domain knowledge. Our customers have really smart people uh, in their organizations, but they don't necessarily have uh, that much programming experience. So we'll see growth, I think, in the low code and no code solution area <clears throat> where um, we'll, able, we'll be able to leverage their expertise a little bit more. I think also as time goes by, there'll be improved dev literacy in, in the next generations that come after me. So hopefully that will start to, to be more uh, to solve the problem itself. Security challenges are another big one. This one's really interesting because we spend a lot of time again um, managing different teams within our customers uh, to try and adhere to their security policies. And there are as many different security policies and three times as many teams that are in that as there are customers that we work with. So this is um, yeah, a complex issue. Fortunately for us, what we are seeing is the cloud, the dominance of the cloud providers and those particularly dominant cloud providers means that instead of having to deal with each customer individually, we're now dealing with a relatively standardized approach for each of the cloud platforms that they use rather than the customer themselves, which is way smoother than the previous way. Speaking more generally, um, UX is hard. So there are actually quite a few features that we have fully developed that are waiting on an appropriate way to expose them to our customer. It's something that we are looking into as an organization from a process improvement perspective, but at some point we probably need to buy the bullet, bite the bullet and hire more programmers. I'm told I can't use this forum as a call for resumes, however, but maybe uh, you can email Jasmine later. Um, managing complexity is also hard, ensuring that we deliver quickly, but don't build excessive technical debt. It's also pretty off topic, so I think I'll just move on. Looking forward, uh, some big things that are in the pipeline are improvements to object recognition. There are plenty of libraries available from big tech companies that allow you to identify a person walking through a facility or a dog or a pump or a thickener or what you had for breakfast. This will help in AR integration and also in processing old models that are poorly tagged or in processing photogrammetry and LIDAR scans, separating out objects from clusters of points and drawing links between scanned objects and their identities. I'm excited to play around with this a little bit. Um, speaking on AR a bit more detailed, AR devices or AR via tablets and mobile devices will increasingly be a useful way for field personnel to engage with the asset. Live data from the digital, from the digital twin, why it's such a tongue twister. Live data from the DT can be pulled so that a person can see current operating procedures overlaid on equipment in front of them. Additionally, the AR device can recognize their position and what they're looking at and provide a link through the digital twin to documentation and work instructions or access that the permit to work system, for example, to determine where work is currently or will soon be underway in the person's area. Uh, for us, I think the main barrier to this getting up to speed is uh, a little bit hardware, but also just internet connectivity at site and the remoteness of the places that we work. So you need to have decent network coverage and it's usually pretty hot in the Pilbara or offshore in the Northwest Shelf. So um, devices that can actually survive in those environments are what are mostly holding that back. Uh, 4D visualization or adding some sort of a time scrubbing component to the digital twin. This is already possible actually, and to some extent we already have it working, particularly for um, like trend data, for example. But there are UR UX challenges associated with providing a standardized and user-friendly approach to whole plant time scrubbing. One example of this, and there are many, many examples, is finding a way to indicate when data might be stale or not available for a period of time. If you show somebody uh, a state that is actually pulled from the last piece of information that you had, it can be incorrect or invalid, and it can make people or lead people to make invalid assumptions and conclusions based on the state of the plant. So sometimes providing the wrong data can be more damaging than providing no data at all. And it's making these decisions on how to present that, that, that are we're wrestling with at the moment predominantly. Um, automated scans, these are already taking place, but I think the workflow to ingest the data and schedule the next scan will increasingly improve and require less and less human intervention. <clears throat> Finally, merging the two different types of digital twins uh, under one consolidated roof is somewhere we'll be heading in the next five years. I think there'll always be benefit in maintaining flexibility in who provides which part of a digital twin, because there is a difference in specialization. 
but some things like the data aggregation make sense to do in one place before feeding to downstream users. Okay, this is my last slide, so I'll just wrap things up with four lessons that we've learned along the way, chosen almost at random um, by what bothered me the most in the last couple of weeks. So irrespective of whether or not you're using a game engine to build your digital twin, I think it's very important you start with a clear and simple use case um, if you want success. So as in that case study example I showed you and these top two examples, um, we've had some customers, in fact, from these three customers, one came to us and asked, we need a digital twin to be able to find our equipment. That's search and find functionality. Another one said they needed to have common access to their various different data systems. In both of these cases, we have had a really successful working relationship. We managed to deliver a product that they loved and they're continuing to use and we've continued to scale up and, and build upon a base use case. In the third instance, we had a customer who was uh, really awesome, lovely people, smart people, uh, but they were directed to seek a digital twin. And so they sought a digital twin. There wasn't a particular use case in mind and we sort of came up with something along the way, but in the end we delivered them a digital twin that had no customer waiting to use it. Uh, they were happy with the project, but it was ultimately never used and the digital twin itself grew stale. So if there aren't success criteria, it's really hard to actually get traction with your, with your solution and to actually build upon it um, and build something that's actually meaningful. Secondly, uh, prototype quickly and don't get caught up in mega features. Uh, this one is about not doing things the old way where you try and scope a mega project um, that by the time you deliver it is old tech and is no longer relevant to the organization and people have found other workarounds for that particular, particular issue they had. So it's much better to get something in your users' hands uh, and let them play with it. You'll find out pretty quickly whether or not they use it, whether or not there are problems with it, um, and perhaps if you're wasting your time, you should just move on. Um, it's better for you and it's typically better for, the, it's also definitely better for the customer. Leverage standards, but manage dependencies. That's pretty much what this entire talk's been about. Um, so the leverage standards part, if there's stuff out there that can help you use it, it'll help you to move faster, um, but also make sure that you have a backup plan in case the business model of that particular thing you're leveraging decides to change or something like that. Uh, and finally, don't be afraid to do, to take the time to do things right uh, and to rewrite code. It's one we have to keep fresh in our mind um, because we do come across issues where we, we try to find the short solution just for a particular deadline and it always ends up in more work. Our devs are much more valuable than me, even though they won't get in front of a camera. Um, so trying to make sure that their life is easy and that they're not stuck in busy work will lead to a successful business. And that's it. That's all I have for you. So I think I'll pass back to um, Jazril, maybe, to take over, yeah. or oh, how this works. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. That was a really good presentation, a lot of great content, um, and a lot of interesting topics that you covered. I think that our, operational, our team would really appreciate the operational DT for data access with all the data <laughs> overload that we're currently experiencing. But yes, uh, anyways, let me just share my screen. Yep, so there will definitely be time for a short Q&A session. I saw a lot of um, interesting questions going up in the chat box, so we will get to that. But yeah, uh, before we proceed to that, um, I just wanted to mention um, some of our upcoming webinars as well as courses we have scheduled um, that you might be interested in. So we, uh, our very next webinar is on the 28th of July. Um, it's on the importance of systemic view in accident slash incident investigation. This one will be presented by Dr. Sotani, our EIT lecturer with experience in civil and railway engineering. Um, there is also another webinar on August 3rd um, that's on protection slash technical issues when implementing renewables and alternatives. This one will be presented by our experienced professor um, Akhtar here at EIT. He's recognized internationally, internationally and nationally for his research and also in the education space. So 
all our technical webinars um, are usually held weekly every Thursday. We try to. Um, sometimes there might be additional webinars in the week. Um, they're usually at 3 p.m. Um, Australian Western Standard Time and they are all hosted online. So if you're interested to attend, you can register on our news and events page, which um, I also have there on the slides. Um, all details will be on the page. Um, there are a couple scheduled a couple of webinars scheduled over the next few weeks. So yeah, just keep a lookout for them. And our upcoming courses, uh, just to introduce some of our upcoming courses and um, I guess all, um, just a quick overview of when they're scheduled. Uh, we have our professional certificate of competency. These are our three months professional development short courses. And also we have our advanced diploma and diploma courses. These courses um, run throughout the year, so um, they have multiple course intakes. Um, we have a number of professional certificates starting in August this year, for example. So, um, you know, depending on um, when you're interested um, to enroll in the year, you can. It would be best to go on our EIT website, look at um, you know the course, the range of courses, to see which um, intake um, suits um, your timeline. We also have um, our grad certs and masters starting in January 2023 next year and also our undergrad certs as well as bachelors starting also next year but in February. So most of these units in the grad certs and the undergrad certs are drawn from our bachelor's as well as master's degrees respectively. Um, this means if you've completed those calls, um, it might be um, able to provide a credit pathway into a bachelor's or master's from the undergrad and grad certs. Um, of course, if you meet the eligibility, eligibility criteria and you wish to obviously um, advance um, to those higher qualifications with us um, and these courses, um, the grad certs and undergrad certs can be completed as um, quickly as six months. Then we also have um, our on-campus programs. We have the bachelor's, master's and um, a doctorate program and they're all available to study on our Perth or Melbourne campus. So um, a number of these bachelor's and uh, master's qualifications are accredited by Engineers Australia and also recognised by um, the three international accords, so the Sydney, Washington um, and Dublin um, accord. But for the on campus, it's more focused on Sydney and Washington, Washington Accord, sorry. So you have the option to um, apply directly or through one of our EIT educations for our on campus degrees. If you're an international student, um, if you are um, interested in any of our courses mentioned here, just visit um, our EIT website or the schedule page, which, which I've also linked here on the slides. So yeah. That's all from me. Um, we can proceed to our Q&A session now. Um, I saw a couple of questions in the chat already as mentioned, so I'll get to that. But in the meantime, if anyone has any more questions, just feel free to add that as well. I think we had one asking, can- I've got a few here that um, yeah. my, my sidekick, Craig, <laughs> noted down for <laughs> if you don't mind. That's real. Yeah, that yeah, okay? no, that's all good, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Um, so I think Emmanuel asked, uh, are these modeled with point clouds? And in answer to that question, I don't know, it might have come clearer later, but uh, not none of the stuff that I showed you today is was pulled from point clouds, but we do do some stuff with LiDAR. All of our content was derived from source CAD models, typically. Um, so sometimes we've yeah, we've done a few different things. So we've pulled from LiDAR, we've pulled from photogrammetry, but most of our digital twins are built off of CAD source models. And usually if we do get the LiDAR, we'd like to build um, like rough models underneath them for it kind of helps us with the tagging and linking to objects and to data. So we, yeah, if that's a fuzzy answer to the question. Um, those ones are not from point clouds. Can digital twins make us learn how to unlock smartphones? I think that was a joke. Was it? Or I don't know. Okay, I don't understand the question. So, Simeli, if you could um, maybe make that one a little bit clearer for me, I'm not sure I understand it. Uh, if you want to learn more about Digital Twins, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I think, I don't know if my email is here, but um, I'm sure you can find me and you can find our website, sencom.com.au. Um, from 
da, 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 da. what else do we have? Sridhar, what is the software used? So we use, um, we built our digital twin on the Unity engine, um, but we also leverage uh, Blazor as a web stack that we use for the digital twin side of things. Um, and we also do a bunch of work that is our own code as well. So a lot of custom stuff as well. So that's Indie is our software package. And finally from Eureka, how long does it take to develop a digital twin? Uh, it's one of those piece of string questions. Um, but for us to get a digital twin up and running, given a few criteria, like you have source models and you have a data system that's got, that we can connect to via an API, we can actually get a digital twin running relatively quickly these days. Um, I think the world record time we've done is probably a couple of weeks, but that was a really perfect storm, perfect um, situation. To actually build the underlying tech and get a digital twin up and running, uh, the work we did for the customer case study, it took us, I think, about 18 months before we had a, a, a platform that was really complete and was where we uh, were happy to put it into production. Cool. And they're the only questions I, I, that I had um, noted down for me. Yeah. If there are any other. Uh, I think there was another question from Abraham. Um, he says um, he did a game study course. Um, there were 10 games named to be the changes of the world, such as Pokemon Go, GTA. Um, how can, his question is, how can gaming industry limit game changing power to only 10 games over all these 40 years? Uh, bias or just whatever information is exposed. Um, there are, yeah, I'm sure there's many, many game changing games, but um, at least for when I was doing the research for this presentation, you tend to, to build it based on what caused a shift in the industry after that game was released. Um, and that's why I think Doom is really, really regarded as breaking territory, sort of building, um, pushing towards the 3D environments and immersion. Uh, their lighting stuff was really impressive. Sonic, I'm not sure, but yeah, certainly something I remember and would consider massive. Pokemon Go, I imagine it's because of their uh, mobile deployment and the fact that they were using, um, uh, actually Craig would give a better answer to this than me, but effectively AR and like positional GPS stuff to, to influence their gaming. GTA was streaming content and their shift from a top-down 2D stuff into 3D was really uh, remarkable. So. Um, how can you limit it? You could probably make the list as long as you wanted, but at some point you have to end the the course. Um, and so I guess they, they pick their favorites. Just another one, I think Emmanuel asked, um, so is the metaverse the same as the digital twin? Uh, there's overlap. Metaverse is another one of those terms that um, I'm not really very fond of at the moment, but I might become more fond of it as time goes by. Um, and it's, it's sort of nothing new, but it's been branded. Um, so yeah, there are overlaps, uh, metaverse could be in some shape or form, a digital twin, but for it to actually be that it would need to actually represent something in the real world. So I guess that's the difference, like a metaverse that represented the real world would be a digital twin of the real world. But it's not I think similar, sorry. Yeah, I think similar to one of the other questions that were asked, I think someone's in the 3D capture industry and he wants to know if there's any, um, I guess, further kind of training that he could go into. Uh, yeah, it really depends on what he's doing in the 3D capture industry. Um, again, happy to take, take emails, um, but it's not really what we do. <clears throat> it, um, so if he's talking about drone capture, et cetera, et cetera, I think there's, there's probably better people to answer that question than me. If he's talking more about processing the 3D capture tech stuff, then uh, we could have a conversation. Right, is there any other questions? Nope. Thank you. Right, that seems to be it. Then I will just quickly wrap up the session here. Um, if there's any questions you still have or that we were not able to get to, feel free to email them to um, us at our webinar contact. I'll just post it in the chat box now. And obviously, um, 
if Greg is happy to take some of the questions as well, that's more specific um, to the topic that you're interested in, um, you can do that as well. Um, just a quick reminder, I know a lot of people are still asking in the chat box. So yes, the certificate of attendance will be emailed out to you. But to do that, you need to fill out the survey form. Once we receive the responses, we will then um, endeavor to um, send it out to you. Um, I'll just also leave the QR link in the chat box now um, just for easy access um, and you can also do it via the QR code that's there on the slide as well just use your camera um, on your phones to scan it and it should take you straight to the survey response right seems to be it right we'll end the session here thanks guys thanks Greg see you guys in our next webinar session